as I'm recording this speech, Sarajevo is in imminent danger of falling. Negotiations are going on in Geneva, and the United States is teetering on the verge of some kind of military gesture. The Serbs started their campaign against Sarajevo on June 28th, that is, a month ago. They moved progressively. First, the electricity was cut off, then the gas, then the diesel fuel. Finally, they launched a military attack. Conditions are now worse than at any time during the 16-month siege of Sarajevo. The electricity has been cut for nearly a month, and there is a shortage of diesel. The hospitals are without power. The water supply is contaminated. The first cases of dysentery have been reported, and hepatitis has increased. There is imminent danger of epidemic disease. I follow the situation in Sarajevo particularly closely because my foundation has been very active there. We provided coal, firewood, and some charcoal during the winter. We have been repairing and extending the gas lines. We have helped restore the bakery. We provided seeds for planting. Until we installed the satellite phone system, there was no way the civilian population could have contact with the outside world. The only clean water that is available has been installed and maintained by my foundation. It consists of two deep wells from which water is pumped to water taps that are out of sight of the snipers, though unfortunately not out of range of the artillery. The situation in some of the other enclaves of eastern Bosnia is even worse than in Sarajevo. And central Bosnia, which had been relatively stable, is now destabilized by the influx of refugees and chaotic fighting between Serbs, Muslims, and Croats. We are heading into a human catastrophe of the first magnitude. It doesn't quite compare with the Holocaust perpetrated by Nazi Germany, but in one respect, it is even worse. We did go to war with Germany, whereas in Bosnia, we are standing idly by. The world doesn't seem to appreciate what is at stake in Bosnia. We are aware of the human suffering. We are outraged at the atrocities. We are humiliated by the inability of both the United Nations and the European community to prevent violence. But we don't quite understand the implications of our failure to intervene militarily. If we did, we would have intervened long ago. What is happening in Bosnia will demonstrate once again that borders can be changed by force, and the world will accept the accomplished fact, the fait accompli. There is nothing new in this. It has happened before. It merely goes to show that we have not succeeded in establishing a new world order, which is capable of upholding the rule of law, protecting human rights, and resolving conflicts peacefully. Events in Bosnia have also shown that there is no limit to the brutality that can be employed in the service of a national goal. Indeed, that brutality against the civilian population is an effective instrument of national policy. That is a much graver matter. Brutality contradicts what our civilization stands for. It has always existed, but it is what we are trying to overcome. The unspeakable brutality that we have witnessed in Bosnia has been committed in the name of a doctrine, the doctrine of the ethnic state. That is where the danger lies. The ethnic state leaves no room for people with different ethnic identities. And ethnic cleansing can turn ethnic identity into a matter of life and death. If it prevails, it is the end of our civilization as we know it. I realize these are large words, but I believe they are justified. This is not the first time that our civilization has been threatened by a doctrine. Communism posed such a threat, and before that, the Nazi dogma. Indeed, almost any doctrine can become a threat to our civilization if it is taken seriously enough, and if it can gather sufficient force. In the Middle Ages, people used to go to war over the doctrine of transubstantiation. 
A sense of ethnic identity has been a powerful force throughout history. In particular, it has played an important role in the formation of the modern state. As an historical force, it has been rivaled only by religion, especially if we treat communism as a form of secular religion. There is nothing inherently evil in having a sense of ethnic identity. On the contrary, it is an important element in holding a nation together, and the existence of nations and nationalities has given our civilization the diversity it needs to be viable and creative. But when ethnic identity is promoted to a doctrine, it becomes harmful. When it is used as a criterion of citizenship, it infringes on human rights. And when it is used as a justification for destroying rival ethnic groups, it begins to endanger civilization. That is what is happening in Bosnia. The civilized world has been surprisingly complacent. Public opinion has been aroused from time to time by pictures of atrocities and stories about the suffering of the civilian population. But governments have gone out of their way to diffuse the public concern, and on the whole, they have been remarkably successful. The Balkans have been painted as some kind of hellhole where ethnic conflicts are endemic and where one should stay out if at all possible. One can engage in humanitarian relief and conflict resolution, but one should avoid taking sides because all sides are to blame. This is the message the general public is receiving, but the politicians and the foreign office ought to know better. They are probably influenced by what is going on in Northern Ireland and by their memories of what happened in Yugoslavia during the Second World War. They ought to remember Munich. Munich was the appeasement of an aggressor, a failure of political will in a democracy, and it was the prelude to something much bigger and much more painful. It can be argued that Milosevic is no Hitler and the greater Serbia doesn't pose the same threat as Nazi Germany did. Maybe so, but the similarities are disturbing. Hitler laid down his program in Mein Kampf, while Milosevic adopted a blueprint for, for a greater Serbia drawn up by the Serbian Academy of Sciences. It is true that greater Serbia will never be as powerful as Nazi Germany, so that on his own, Milosevic can never equal Hitler. But the principle he stands for can spread Conditions are particularly propitious for it. Communism was a universal closed system. It has failed. The region which had been dominated by communist dogma could now join the universal open system that we call the free world. But that would require a helping hand from the free world because an open society is a more sophisticated, more advanced form of organization than a closed one. Without such help, the universal closed system based on communism is likely to break down into particular closed systems based on the principle of national or ethnic identity. In order to mobilize society behind an ethnic principle, you need an enemy. If it doesn't exist, you need to invent one. That is what Hitler did when he espoused anti-Semitism. In the post-communist world, you don't need to look very far because communism, in its universalist zeal, suppressed national and ethnic interests, and there are many scores to settle. What is most disturbing is the way the free world is responding. Democratic leaders often avoid hard choices. That is what happened before the Second World War. That is what is happening today. Instead of taking a firm stand somewhere along the way, we have opted for conciliation and humanitarian assistance. But humanitarian goals cannot always be achieved by humanitarian means. By making it clear that we are not willing to intervene militarily, we have set ourselves up for one humiliation after another.